Hello, everyone. I'm Professor Paul Carrier of the Western Michigan University Thomas M. Cooley Law School. What I'd like to do today is to delve further into the issue of consideration as one of the components of contracts formation. Remember, we talked about four things that were absolutely vital to form a contract. We had to have the proper offer. We had to have the proper acceptance. We had to have this sufficient specificity of essential terms or enough definiteness of major terms, also sometimes called dickered terms, the ones that are really important. Uh, and the final element, which I like to consider number three, but you can call it three or four, is consideration. And it's that quid pro quo. Each side has to want something for the other parties from the other party's side and give something in return. A uh, ball for two dollars, a promise to paint the garage for a promise to pay a thousand dollars. Something that's legally binding and, and sufficient. Keeping in mind that we look at the legal sufficiency and then typically stop. If we find legal sufficiency on both sides of an equation, then consideration is valid. If there's a huge disparity if things do not feel right, for example, we're looking at tax evasion, a gift, for example, a bribe, then the courts might delve into the question of adequacy. But remember, that's more of an exception than the rule. Okay? Well, we talked about what is consideration. And last week we, in class six, we began to talk about certain things that are not consideration. And in week seven, class seven, we go into further things that are not are sometimes not consideration. One of them is a past consideration. If something has already been done, completed, gratuitously, then a subsequent promise to pay for it is not really matched with proper consideration. Uh, so if you found my dog and returned it to my yard, and five weeks later I say, you know, that was really nice of you, I should give you $500 for that. And then I don't you sue me. My defense would be that you didn't provide any consideration for the $500. I didn't ask you for, any, for anything. You already took care of that in the past. Okay? And I think that last week I mentioned the way around that is to add something new. Well, if you give me $500 for returning your dog, which I did in the past, I will also walk the dog three times this week while you're on vacation. That would be a small but extra thing onto which the formation of a contract can latch. My 500, not for what you did in the past, okay, but what for you'll do now or in the future, which is walking my dog. Uh, so keep it, take a look to see if you see some kind of past consideration. Um, there are some exceptions as well where you see uh, something done in the past or a gratuitous promise made and the courts have begun to make changes to the system where certain things that are not necessarily truly bound by consideration. The courts have begun to, and public policy has supported the idea that certain things should be binding anyway. A good example is uh, the promise to pay the past debt of someone's own child. And the example is that somebody is sick, a doctor takes care of that sick child, a year later the doctor finds the parent, the parent agrees to pay the fee for fixing the child, the child couldn't afford it. Well, if that child was an adult, then there's no legal responsibility even back when the child was, was cared for. And so a parent would not be responsible for that. But what if the child was a minor when the service was done? Okay, and then the, the parent is legally responsible for that child when the service was done. Was it done in the past? Yes. But if a parent says, you helped my underage child for whom I'm legally responsible a year ago, what was your fee? I should pay that. I owe you $200. Public policy says that even though it was past consideration, morally we should probably recognize that one. And the public policy would be that we would like to encourage uh, good Samaritans to help children who may need help at a time with the possibility that maybe a promise to pay by a parent will be honored and not be struck down by this concept of a, a lack of consideration because it was a past consideration. Okay? Another area 
if there is a past debt that has been wiped out legally, for example, if you go bankrupt, you don't have to pay anyone anymore. Legally, your debts are wiped clean. Statute of limitations, which we will learn uh, a little bit later uh, in the term as, a, as an affirmative defense. There's a time when you must bring a lawsuit. If you don't bring a lawsuit, the law cuts you off. You still have that legal right, but you can't take it to court anymore. And the idea is to force people to timely bring lawsuits and not wait 50 years. Don't come to me 50 years from now and remind me I owe you $10 on some agreement that we had. That would be ridiculous. So to ensure the proper administration of justice and the timely filing of suits, we have this statute of limitations idea where the law will block a lawsuit so that even though a debt was owed, it is legally not enforceable. Okay? It makes sense. With a past debt, it may have been wiped out by a statute of limitations or bankruptcy. If later the party who owed money but not any longer because of the, the legal change promises to pay, well, that was a past debt that was discharged in law somehow. And so in the old days, where was the new consideration to the party who wanted the money and who heard the promise? And the answer was, there was none. Oh, that's really nice of you. I'm glad that even though you don't have to pay me, you will pay me. That's great. I appreciate it. Well, that's not consideration. Okay? But you can see the idea morally that if someone recognizes a past debt and promises afterward that maybe he or she should not be able to hide behind the lack of consideration. And so the law has changed to the effect that, morally, but now legally, if a person who owed a debt and has been discharged promises afterward to pay it, that promise is treated as being supported by consideration on the other side. Okay, even though technically there's not really morally, you should pay it. And so the but one limitation on that is, if the person who owed a debt and no longer owes it but promises makes that promise, it is only enforceable now up to the amount promised. So if I owed a thousand dollars but that was discharged, and I said, you know, I don't really have to pay you, but I feel badly. I should give you five hundred dollars. I promised to pay you five hundred dollars. Let me get it for you next week then I would have renewed that debt, even though you really didn't have any consideration for the $500 now, okay? That was a past debt that was discharged. The law would lock it in now uh, to the amount of what I promised, which is $500. If I say nothing, I should pay you, I promise to pay you, it renews the entire past debt that's been discharged. But if I put a limit on it, that it's only enforceable up to that limit. And I forget the number, but there is a restatement second section of contracts on that very point, which is, I think, worth uh, knowing. Uh, okay? Another, what I consider to be a moral obligation, where we see a change in law, where technically, and a hundred years ago, there really was no proper consideration. But the law finds a way to try and work it anyway. And that's exa the example in one of the books, I think it's your Mills case. Uh, Mills versus uh, Wyman where somebody sees a dangerous situation, prevents it, becomes crippled. And the person who was saved from this accident promises to pay that crippled person and or his family until he dies because of saving the life. Well, did he look down when the, the, the uh, structure, the, the, the bale of hay, the, the whatever thing was falling? No. Did he say, wait, you're about to get hit by a 5,000-pound boulder. If you promise me that if I save you and I'm hurt, you'll pay me for the rest of my life, I'll stop it and I'll save you, right? You can't do that. There's no time. So technically, the Good Samaritan prevented this probable death of a person below and then got hurt in the process, and there was no time to make any agreement and certainly no agreement on consideration, right? And that millisecond, did one yell, hey, will you pay if I get hurt saving you? The other one says, well, if you save me, uh, I'll pay you just for the rest of your life if you're hurt that badly. There's no time for that, okay? So technically, there really was no agreement. There was no real, at least not any communicated offer, right? But the courts have treated that as a lack of consideration um, because the person did it gratuitously, and he didn't have time to think about what the other side was going to give. But when the other party promised, 
the court basically fudges things and says, well, had he known he was about to die, he would have made that promise to pay, which would have been good consideration. So, but for the emergency situation where there wasn't time to negotiate it, they would have negotiated it, and both of them would have been given consideration. And so morally, we're going to treat it as if he would have given consideration had he known he was about to die, and this person would save him for the return consideration. And so we're going to hold that as binding. And so I guess what I can say is look for consideration on both sides and understand that in certain cases there are exceptions because the situation looks so morally unjustifiable that courts stretch to pretend that there is consideration, even though there probably is not in the truest sense of the word. Another area where it's not consideration is a pre-existing duty. If I promise to paint your garage for $1,000, and that's a binding promise, I can't come up later and say, I need $1,500 or I'm going to stop painting your garage, right? I've already promised to pay it for $1,000. That's our deal, okay? And so if I try to get $500 more and you shake your head, yes, at the end of the day, you won't have to pay me that extra $500. I have a pre-existing duty to do it for $1,000. And the way around that, of course, is to change something, where I'd say, I need 500 but for that extra money, I will also paint your doghouse. That would be enough to be consideration for the extra $500. But if I did nothing extra, I'd given no consideration for your promise on increase, which I forced you to give me. And so you could argue, there was no proper consideration. I am not bound for $500, because the other side didn't give me any consideration for the extra $500. Okay? Another concept, which is somewhat related, is if you see parties with this pre-existing duty, uh, there's certainly the ability to modify. And for example, uh, you were going to pay me $1,000. I signed up and I promised that. I can't finish for less than $1,700, so I can walk away and you can sue me and get somebody else to finish the painting. Or you can agree to give me $1,700 and... With regard to that extra $700 I need, I will also paint the trim on your windowsills, or I'll paint the flower boxes, okay? That way we can say we have an agreement, it's fully backed by consideration, it's fully binding as stated, but we need to make a change, right? And my change is, I'll do a little bit more painting, your change is, you'll pay another $700, realizing I need it and I'll do something else in support of it, that extra consideration, right, for the change. Um, oh, we could. Oh, there's also this concept of novation. We could just say, throw the old contract away completely. No duties, no nothing. And let's set up a new one right now. You will finish now, by next week, for $1,700. And then I agree I will pay you $1,700. So we can either modify the original contract, but when you see a modification, except for sale of goods UCC Article 2, and I'll bring that up in class. You need to see return consideration for the extra that was above and beyond the pre-existing duty. Okay, so if you have a motorcycle for 15000 delivering the motorcycle earlier than promised is an extra thing. So let me give you $10 or a beer for the early delivery because that's a new aspect. That is a modification, and that modification needs its own consideration, technically speaking. Uh, there's a way around that in Article 2, 2-209, which I'll cover in class. Uh, okay, but um, keep in mind, modifications should also be backed by consideration as a general rule. Or we can throw away the old contract and, and novate. Just redo the thing from scratch, throwing away the other one, and that's also a possible way, a way around this lack of consideration problem. Uh, okay, when we get to week 8, we will talk about consideration substitutes. In certain cases... It's again, it almost goes back to this moral obligation. There's a case where there is no proper consideration um, as required by law. And yet, something has gone so wrong that courts are going to try to concoct something and pretend as if there is consideration. It is a consideration substitute. And so, once we cover that next week in week eight, we will be finished with contract formation, and then we will move into the next big component of, uh, of contract law, which is damages.